Hello and welcome to Lore Watch, a roundtable freeform discussion about lore and our favorite video games. I'm your host, Joe Perez, one of several lore focused folks from Blizzard Watch, and I've got my stupendous co host with me today, Matt Ross. How are you doing today, Matt? I am fine, boy. <laughs> uh, I take it you've been starting in on it. Have you played nope, any of it? Nope, don't have a game console that can even play it. Oh, that's sad. We got to fix that. I've been watching YouTube videos, so I don't really have to play the game. Since, you know, you watch one YouTube video about a subject and then YouTube is like, hey, throws them at you over and over again until you watch them because otherwise they won't go away. So, yeah. All hail the algorithm. Uh, <laughs> we're we're going to be talking about that game at some point, folks. Trust me, we will. Uh, but we're not today. Today, we're going to be talking about Dragonflight. Uh, we did receive several questions. Thank you very much. Uh, but we also want to just talk about the experience of the storytelling uh, in the first initial moments, the first zone, the waking shore, um, as we, you know, as we've experienced, as Matt and I have experienced it, and kind of give our opinions on it a little bit before we get into the questions. But if you have questions for this podcast or any of our podcasts, I want you to go ahead and send those into podcast at blizzardwatch.com, uh, singular podcast at blizzardwatch.com. Specify the show that it is for. And uh, we'll go ahead and try to incorporate it in as the theme allows. Uh, if you don't want to send us an email and you are a Patreon supporter, you can go ahead and jump over to the Discord server to our Patreon Q and podcast questions channel. Uh, go ahead and throw your questions in there. As a fact, uh, pretty much every single one of them we've got here is from that channel today. Uh, it's our way of saying thank you to our, our Patreon supporters uh, for helping us kind of keep the lights on and, and make sure that we can continue to do shows like this by giving them first dibs on getting their question answered. Now, if you can't support us and you don't want to send the email, uh, we understand Patreon uh, costs money. That, that's a thing. Uh, and times are tough for everybody. So I understand if you can't support us there, but you still support us by spreading the word and sharing our content with everybody. You can go ahead and send the questions in as well to our Q and podcast questions channel, uh, which is just open for everybody. And we will look there as well. Uh, as a random aside, I do want to actually take a moment to thank all of our listeners out there. This last year was one of the, it was the first year that we actually popped up on Spotify, giving it a try to see how things were in that time frame. Your support has actually helped us quite a bit just by listening and sharing it. Uh, we actually got some metrics as the end of the year, as you know, Spotify is wont to do, not just the end in review for uh, folks that listen to stuff, but also people that produce content. Uh, we were in the top 10% most shared podcasts in our category, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you look at the sheer volume of podcasts that are on the, on Spotify, that's pretty momentous. And that's because of you. So thank you very much for everybody who continues to support us by spreading, uh, spreading the word, sharing links to the, your favorite episodes and, and, uh, you know, making us feel warm and fuzzy about the work we do. It's kind of, kind of, kind of really good feeling. I don't know if you want to say anything about that, Matt. No, I feel nothing inside me is nothing but death. No, seriously. <laughs> thanks guys. Uh, all right. But enough of that. We're going to get into, uh, the show here. So Matt is doing that thing where uh, we were talking about the show a little bit earlier and he was like, yeah, I just left the first zone. That's not a detriment to Matt's leveling skills. It's this. There's, there's so much to do. Actually, there's it's also the fact that Matt has leveling five warriors simultaneously. Uh, <laughs> so my wife and I together just today and yesterday got up to like 65. Um before that, I'd leveled a warrior to 62, another warrior to 63, another warrior to 62, and uh, the last warrior is not leveled yet, but has gotten to the dragon up. So, yeah, that's not the best way to get through the game quickly. It just, just, <laughs> but I felt like, you know what? F it. I don't want to get through the game quickly. I don't want to burn through it to seven. No. I know, you know, I know people who do that, and that's great if that's what you want to do, but I'm taking my time and leveling my characters and having fun. So... Yeah, I I did the beta, so I know a bit about the zones past here. But in terms of really getting to see most of the story bits, yeah, um, just just now finished up with the Waking Shores and headed into the Onaria Plains. So yeah, there is a lot to explore. Yeah, and I think that's one of the the things that I heard from uh, Guildies as we were talking about it too is the Waking Shore has a bit of density to it. Um, Maybe I think it has more more quest density than any of the other zones and the other ones are not exactly like skimpy or anything like that when it comes to uh, how much they're actually putting in as far as quests and story and events. 
but the waking shore is kind of it's your introduction to Dragonflight, right? As a new player or as a player coming back and, and experience this this uh expansion for the first time, waking shore is the first thing you're going to see. It's the first thing you're going to interact with. It's how you get introduced to the island, essentially. And so it being a little more dense and introducing you to what is essentially most of the major conflicts that are going on makes sense, right? So you get to understand who the primalists are, uh, what their motivations are, the fact that they have cultists. Uh, you get to see some of the story stuff revolving around some of the defectors of the Drakthir. Uh, you get to see some of the stuff, which, again, there's going to be mild spoilers for, for this episode, folks. Hopefully that goes without saying so, uh, but I'm going to say it anyway. Mild spoilers for The Waking Shore, and when we get to the questions, probably for some some future ones as well. So this might, if you're leveling through and you want to be surprised, I understand. Come back to this episode after you you've you've gone through these zones. Um, but with that said, I mean, getting to see the agents of Rathion in particular and seeing how much his forces, I don't say how much his forces have grown, but he hasn't been idle. Right. Like, I thought that was really a cool introduction to that because it wasn't just left and right anymore. Uh, he has a bunch of agents. He has talons, uh, which are like his military force ish. Um, and we always knew that he continued to go. But like, he's got people that aren't dragons that follow him, that that support him. And it was interesting seeing them sort of come up and them sort of like trying to help take over or take back some of the ancestral uh, dragon homes because the waking shore right there. That's where the black dragon flight at one point called home. That's where like the big volcanoes are. That's where uh, the molten glass is. And it was interesting to see that sort of be given flesh and how feverishly Rathion was, was sort of working to get that back. Like we knew we talked about this last week and, and I believe the week before even we know he wants to reclaim his legacy. He wants to, to bring the drag, the black dragon flight back. And he has fear and anxiety of becoming like Naltharian, but also really wants to become the aspect and sort of lead his people to a new, a new, a new I want to say a new life, but sort of bring them out of the sins of, of Naltharian's past, like the shadow that, that he's laid over them. Right. Mm, but somebody else has ideas. Why don't you go ahead, Matt? Well, we've been talking about Rathian a lot the past few years, but the true heir of, of Neltharion is back, uh, Sibelian. So we don't have to deal with that little wimp anymore. He's gone. He's nothing. Uh, the true glory of the Black Dragons is at hand. No, I'm kidding. I, I am, <laughs> I'm messing around. But it was kind of interesting doing the, if you do the Rathian bit, which is not exactly the first things you do in the Waking Shore, actually. It's, it's. You start off helping Rathian with one thing, but then he like suddenly is like, what? And has to he runs off to the other side of the zone. Once you get through most of the zone, you can go and and well, you can kind of go earlier. It's up to you where you want it when you want to go to it. But uh, I went over late. Uh, mm -hmm. I did pretty much everything at the uh, the Ruby Life Pools slash Ruby Dragon Shrine area first, and then I went over and, and helped Rathion out. And the the Rathion storyline gets complicated when Rathion, like he's being told by everybody, we don't have the forces to do this. Uh, we, you know, it, it's a good plan. Your plan is a good plan. Uh, even the, 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 uh, there's a Drakthir who's helping you. Uh, the one from the Drakthir shorts, um, can't remember her name, uh, Ember or something. Uh, Ember scale. Ember scale. Yeah. She's, she even says, you know, this plan is a good plan, but we don't have the force to execute it. And Rathion's like, I accept, you know, you've been a good, you've been a good friend and, and a good ally to me. So I accept what you're saying, but you're forgetting me. I'm here. And it's like, you know, if, if nothing else, Rathion, you, you're not shy of confidence, but this is still probably not going to work. Uh, but we head off to do it anyway, because, you know, I, I literally spent the past 18 years playing World of Warcraft going off to do it anyway. So it's not like we knew I was going to, you know what I mean? So you head off to do it. Sorry, and it's then Ember as, Thal. Sorry. Sorry, Ember sorry. Thal, okay. But as we're heading in to do it, uh, as we're trying to execute Rathian's plan, we have to go in and weaken, you know, weaken the Jardin, of course, because you know that's that's how questing works in World of Warcraft. You go in first and, and soften them up. But as you're running in to breach the Citadel and take it back, uh, 
just as you're about to like make your main attack, a whole bunch of black dragons show up mm-hmm. and just start breathing on everything. And you're like, whoa, okay. Wasn't expecting that. And then you get the Rathion Sibelian confrontation that people have been asking for since Rathion debuted. Yeah. They're like, what about Sibelian? Isn't Sibelian still in Outland? And the best part is when he shows up, Sibelian's even like, he's like, who are you? Where have you been? He goes, Outland. <laughs> it's like, you know. And then, I, then, I just, then he goes, who are you? Where did you come from? He's like, yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of the things about it. I don't want to get too spoilery on it, but uh, Sibelian is very much a typical black dragon. I'm not saying he's evil. He might be evil, but I'm we not saying know. that. What I'm saying is that he he thinks like a maze. Like his his plans are laid within plans. So when you you basically spend a lot of time reforging the uh, the the oath stone that the black dragons once had in their citadel obviously it's been broken because well Neltharion broke, broke his oath, oath. Yeah. so they re, you know you and Rathion go ahead and reforge it and Sibelian immediately flies up to the throne while you're doing that and so you have to right race up there and there's a confrontation between the two of them and to the credit of the storyline <clears throat> neither of them is wrong and neither of them is fully right like they're both they're both pretty egocentrical uh, which is, you know, not a shock to anybody who's ever met a black dragon. But Sibelian makes a very, Sibelian's followers make a good point. It's not even Sibelian. Sibelian's like, just talk to my followers then if you think he should be in, in charge of the black flight. And you go to them and like one of them is, one of the ones that helped you reforge the, the stone is like, I like Rathion, but, you know, he's untempered. He, it, you know, Sibelian has experience, hard fought experience. I think he is a, he'd be a better leader for the flight. Then you go, you go to one of the dragons and he's like, you know, while you adventurers and the other flights and even your prince Rathion there were murdering black dragons, Sibelian was, was teaching us how to overcome our corruption. Yeah. That's the big, outland. well, that's the interesting <clears throat> thing too, right? Like they talk about that and they bring that up, but it's sort of left hanging. Sibelian- as to how he did it. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a thing. I mean, we don't know for sure that Spellian is telling the truth on that one, but we'll get back to it. That's the point one of the followers makes. Uh, the third follower, and by the way, as you're going through, you you run into a brood mother. There's a a black brood mother right there who's like, you think it's easy being a brood mother? You have to you have to constantly you know take care of these whelps all the time. Uh, it's like, are you trying to make me feel bad for Nixia because it's working? <laughs> um, but you so you talk to them and you establish you know his followers are like, look. Um, we're the ones with the eggs. We're the ones with the number of dragons. He doesn't have a flight. You know, we are here and we are, you know, we were with Sibelian. So, but then you go talk to Rathian's followers and they make the point, you know, Rathian's been here doing the work this whole time while they've been off doing whatever the heck they've been doing. Um, and, you know, Rathian, if it weren't for Rathian, this entire planet might've got destroyed by the Legion by now. You know, he's the one that a few times created over. the situation. Yeah. He's, he taught. So they make, they make good points too. Um, and then of course, Sibelian's like, look, we've got to get the eggs to uh, the life pools. I mean, you agree with that, right? You know, that has to happen. And Rathian's like, fine, if that's the case, I'm going with you because I'm no way I'm letting you just take those eggs off by yourself. So you go on this wagon because Sibelian's whole plan is supposedly we can't, you know, be spotted. So we're going to take this wagon and that way no one will know dragons are taking eggs to the life pools because why would dragons take a, take a wagon? Uh, so you get on the wagon, you go, and if, of course you have to jump off the wagon repeatedly to fight. But on the way, like just outside the life pools, one of, uh, oh, heck, I can't remember her name, Razagath's, one of Razagath's followers destroys the cart and is like, you know, haha, your flight is doomed. And Rathian was like, great, your plan worked beautifully. And, and Civilian's not even remotely upset. Uh, and if you know full well, once once Civilian is not even remotely upset that there's something going on, you head up to the to the temple and you know, Alex Strauss was like, what happened with the eggs? And he's like, oh, the eggs are fine. I, you know, we, we staged a diversion with the cart and, you know, flew them up. And that's when you get a sense, you know, Sibelian still thinks like a mm-hmm. black dragon. He, he tricked you. He used you. Now, was it a good plan? Absolutely. It was a good plan because it worked. They were so busy trying to destroy the wagon that they didn't realize the dragons were just flying the eggs there. And in fact, Rathian kept going, why don't we just fly the eggs there? Why are we doing this? And so at the end of it, neither of the dragons has really been established as leader of the Black Flight. Uh, Alex Straz is like, I'm, I'm going to take the eggs and I'm going to put them in the life pool so they can be tended and, and grow up because, you know, yay, that's what we want. Because that's, that's my flight's yeah, job. That's what yeah, we do. Yeah. yeah. But in terms of picking a leader for your flight, that's not my department. You know, you guys work it out. I'm not impressed. I'm not impressed by, by Hothead over here, but Sibelian, I have not forgotten that you worked before Deathwing. 
not Neltharian, Deathwing. You know, I that I didn't that hasn't slipped my mind. So yeah, you do what you're gonna do, and I'm going to do what I'm gonna do. Work it out for yourselves. Who's who's gonna be in charge of the flight? And that's the end of the storyline in the Waking Shores. I don't I haven't gone further yet to see if there's more of it. There, um, but, but what I did like about it before I turn it over to Joe because I should turn it over to Joe. One of the things I really did like about it was that it does not, it doesn't like obviously paint either of them as the right choice. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, at the end of it, I'm sitting there thinking, why couldn't you, you two just realize each of you has aspects of your personality, and that wasn't on purpose, um, that would work as the aspect. Like, just work together for now, and once you've got your flight set up, then you can kill each other for who gets to be in charge. You're not there yet. You know what I mean? Like, work on this. So, I did like it. I did think it was well done. Yeah, it's one of the interesting things about it is, like, this entire interaction, everything here is set up, right? And... I think that goes without saying, but I actually really enjoyed how it was set up because like Matt pointed out, neither is painted as the hero or the villain at the end of this. Each of them has still that legacy of, of Deathwing to sort of like contend with and hang over them. Whereas Rathian has tried and, and repeatedly proven himself at least to be working f- with the rest of the dragon flights as much as he can, uh, you know, showing up at the darkest hours, helping Azeroth, uh, being there to sort of like take the fight to uh, Nizoth when it was time, saving Alex Straza like that. That's a that's a, a a big point as well. Like showing up to save her uh, when she decides to get into a, a tussle with Razageth, uh without the other uh, other folks around, the other uh, aspects. And I'm doing that in air quotes. Like he's. Well, I'll be quite frank. That wasn't the problem. I mean, she honestly was doing pretty well against Razageth for most of that fight. She just kept trying to talk her way out of it. Yes. And that's, that's Alex Strauss's biggest problem as a war leader. She isn't. Yeah. She, you know, if, if one of the reasons that, that the, the black dragon flight is so sorely needed is because they are the ones who will just F you up. They're not going to try and talk you out of it. They're just like, they're, okay. They're essentially the over. fighters. They're the yeah. fighters of the group. Yeah. And so, yeah, it, it was, it's an interesting but- to watch. But the interesting thing is, like, it also sets it up for other things as well, which is, like, uh, there are daily quests that, after you get to max level, involve aiding and putting your support behind either Rathion or Sibelian. And you sort of build that up as time goes, and it's all story-related, and it's all, you know, fighting the Jardin and and trying to reclaim that area and making... Uh, finding bits of the legacy and building that up. And it's laying the groundwork for future elements of that story, which I think is really, really nice as well. Uh, it's it's just a really cool moment. And it's probably the one that I was waiting for the most. And I wasn't actually, I didn't think we were going to get it right away. I'm not going to lie. But the fact that it's one of the very early things that happens, I'm super here for it. Like, I think this is really, I, I think that's great. I think it's amazing. So I was very surprised by that. I was also just surprised with uh, how quickly you get into the Ruby life pools, which. Uh, yeah, well, let me talk about one thing before you yeah, get too much into that. One of the things about the Ruby life pools section that I liked is how much of that questing has nothing to do with hitting anything. Yes. And even the stuff that does have to do with hitting stuff is less like, you know, let's go forth and murder and more. Unfortunately, we'll have to drive them out or call them or what have you. It's very much, it's a really good way to get into the Red Dragonflight's perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, in that they are not here, you know, they're here to preserve life, as they keep telling us over and over again. And we keep having problems with this concept. It's like, that's what they're there for. And so that's what the the questing around the Ruby Dragon, the Ruby Life Pools, and the Shrine, and all that, is rooted in that. Um it's it's there's quests to like basically one of the quests it, that's one of my favorites I've now done five times because I just love this quest so much is there's a little baby dragon kind of flying around with a with a duck on its head <laughs> yeah it's got a duck toy and it smacked into a wall and broke its toy and it's like no happy duck no and you find it and it's like please help me my happy duck and you're like child I have fought the Lord of the Firelands himself I have done battle with Sir Garrus's minions. And of course I am going to help you fix your duck. I would like to do nothing more than help you fix that duck. 
And so you do, you fix the duck. And then, like, you know, you get your own duck toy that you can then wear on your head. And then you can take screenshots with yourself with the little duck and the little dragon with a little duck on his head. And then later on, you will go and you'll talk to one of the dragon tenders. And he's got two baby dragons on his head because baby dragons are just climbing on everything. And it's just this entire zone, in my opinion, like, like, is this the expansion of cute things on your head? cute things on other things heads or possibly cute things being the thing on somebody else's head so far all it's yes to all but as much as that's kind of facetious it's also true it is just it's a lot of fun because it's just it's just nice there's one quest that's literally just sitting there with an old dragon and like every so often that was nudging such him. a good quest yeah Let, why don't you talk about that one then that and that's one of the, the things that i i will i really wanted to highlight and i was actually the, that's one of my favorite parts of of the Ruby Pools is that quest was heart wrenching. You sit down and there's just like this old dragon in a dwarf form, just lay, like he's just sitting there looking out over the the land. Uh, and the first thing he says is, "I can't believe we're back here. I never thought we'd actually be back." And then he starts recounting everything that happened. You know how they fought, how uh, you know things got dark and for a while and you know, what happened with his best friend and a, a dragon that he absolutely loved, like not just pl- like platonic friendship, like hinted at romantic love uh, was a black dragon. They were as close as clutch mates. Uh, and then when, you know, ne- when Neltharius became Deathwing and made his pact, you know, it's like he's, they all shifted. They all changed. They all became something other. It was like, they weren't there anymore. And you can feel, feel the heart wrenching and like the, this, the, the gravitas of it. And it's, even then he sends you on a quest to go get his time capsule, which is filled with memories. It's a long quest just based off of time. The only thing that could have possibly made this better is it had, if it had been voice acted, because that's the only downside to it, but it is worth sitting there and going through and doing this quest because it is just a masterclass in storytelling and not just because it's, it's good and, and loreful, but it gives you an idea of how dragons think, right? It gives you an idea of that mindset. It gives you everything from the hope that they had when they were, you know, still brand new to this world in this form, when they had just built the life that they had built. And then it gives you the aftermath of everything that's happened. Cause don't forget like, and, Liz and I were talking about this in, in guild the other night. Uh, really at this point we've existed for 25 years in the game world. And a lot of things have happened, particularly to the dragons in that 25 years. Like it's, that's rapid. That is really, really quick. And for creatures as long lived as them, that's, that's even faster, right? Because their, their concept of time is expanded beyond that. It's just, it's such a well done quest. Like, yeah, and one of the great things about it too is if you play it on a different race. Oh yeah, it reacts differently. Yeah, um, I played it now. So far, I've played it on a night elf, a uh, human, two draenei, one light forge draenei, and a dwarf. Um, the dwarf one, eh, I mean, you know, it's it's fine. Uh, the draenei one, he's talking about how you know you couldn't possibly understand because you know for you how long has it been? But then he stops himself and goes, "Wait, I heard about Argus. I yeah. guess you could understand." Uh, or if you're like on a human, I think the same for the dwarf too. And he's, he's like, well, a lot has happened to you in this short amount of time. Perhaps you can get some understanding of it. And if you're playing a night elf, he's like, you know, you li- you know, you've lived a lot and lost much, especially recently. Perhaps you do understand. It's just interesting that he, that he has that. I don't know what it's like for side. I'm sure that, you know, he's got different results for, you know, each, yeah, for, each for, race. for Volpera, it was basically, basically saying that like, oh yeah, you're sort of, nomadic you don't really understand what it's like to lose a home do you like things like that like it's really nice little touches it's 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 interesting to see them give that much care to something like that and it's an easy quest to miss too like as you're flying through and, and doing everything because he's, yeah, he's just, just sitting of, there he's just sitting there he's not he's not doing anything he's not you know he's just sitting there and he's got a quest thing on him but that's it and he's right next to the big get your dragon riding quest thing which you're going to be more focused on Mm-hmm. You know, because it's like, ooh, dragon fly, dragon riding. So overall, yeah, I, I think it's a quest not to miss, but there's there's a lot of these quests. The quest that sends you around the, the dragon shrine, uh, checking everything out, at one point it has you stop at the, the various life pools of each flight. 
So you stop at the red one, you stop at the blue one, you stop at the green one, you stop at the bronze one, and the the one that's in charge at each of those places talks to you and gives you a rundown of what it's like. And then you get to the black one, and there's nothing there. And there's just this one like old black dragon kin uh, tender who's just sitting there. And you mm-hmm. talk to them, and you're like, so if there's no dragons here, why do you stay? And she just looks at you and goes, hope. Mm-hmm. And then you can mind, these guys have been here this whole time. They didn't leave. They even say, the dragons are back. The dragons are back. They never left the Waking Shores or the Dragon Isles. They have been sitting here waiting for these people to come back. And, and I'm not saying these individual ones did. I'm saying that some dragonkin did this whole time. There were dragonkin here the whole time. And then I haven't noticed. They haven't established yet. Did they go into stasis? Uh, or did, were they just awake the whole time? Do they like have kids and those kids carried on? Like that hasn't been fully cleared up, but they are extremely dedicated to the dragon flights. Uh, all the various dragon kin you see, um, they're, they're like super, super dedicated to it. Um, and there's well, it's actually like one thing we could talk about. In fact, is the the cadet you meet, uh, Sendak. I want to say. Uh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's Sendak. Um, cadet Sendak, when you meet her. I think Cadet Sendak is a she. I'm not 100 percent sure. It is. It is a she. They they refer they they reference her and she when the quest text. Yeah, but Cadet Sendak is is like extremely excited. This is their first anything, their first command, their first being in charge of anything. They're they're like super excited. This is what has me thinking. A lot of these dragons, dragonkin, were like just waiting for the dragons to come back, and they weren't awake. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because because Sendak is super new and. You get there and Sendak shows you around the first place you go, the embassy, and it's it's in ruins, obviously. I mean, no one's been keeping this place up. Another reason I think that the Dragonkin were probably in hibernation. Uh, but they're like, you know, we'll get it fixed up. It's great. The dragons are back. Everything's going to be great. And you, so you go around and you do various quests in the starting, this very first starting area as you get to the Waking Shores. And it's all fine. Um, but then you like get Sendak to call Rathion and Major Domo. I can't remember the name. I feel bad about that. Because I spent a lot of time with them, but I cannot remember the major domo's name. But it's it's one of Alex Strauss's servants. It begins with an S. That's all. I, yeah. That's all I can remember right this second. And he chooses but, to be a Volpera. Yes, she does. Um, so you 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 go through and you you get in touch with them, and they're like the Jardin are here. We got to deal with them. There's also other stuff happening. We've got like lots. The primalists are here. Bad stuff's happening. Uh, so you, you, you get your marching orders and you go out and you start hunting down the Jardin and fighting to help defend the, the area. But then you find out that the primalists have kidnapped a bunch of red dragon eggs mm-hmm. and you find out from Sendak who's been like followed them up there. And so you and Sendak are going in trying to get the baby dragons out, but the baby dragon eggs have already been corrupted by whatever the primalists did and they hatch and go insane and you have to put them down. And Sendak is getting worked up like not, and and they, it's an interesting choice because a lot of times in a game like this they would have her get worked up into a rage. No, it's it's this is, this is raw sorrow. emotion. Yeah, this is sorrow. This is oh no no I'm so sorry. You should have had a better life than this. And you know even as she's killing them, that she's killing them because there is no option. Like for one thing, they're attacking. For the other thing, they've been corrupted and they're never going to be they're never going to be right now. There's something wrong with them. Um, and. As you get to the final quest and the thing, there's one egg left and Sendak and you go in to get it. Sendak deliberately catches the the wards that are defending it and has their energy blasting her while you grab the egg. Once you grab the egg, Sendak dies. Um, we did spoiler warn you, so I don't feel too bad about yeah. that. Um, but yeah, Sendak dies and you, you run away because you can't fight. Like you've got an 80% run speed buff and you just run. Because th- there's a thing on the U that if you stop to fight, the egg will drop, and then after a few seconds, it will be gone, and you will fit. You basically have to go back and do the quest again. So you just run out of there. Uh, a couple times I got hit by things, but I just just ran past them. I didn't pay attention. And you get it back, and this is what eventually takes you to the, the Ruby Life pools because they want like the egg that you've got back has been affected in some way, and so they need to figure out: can we cure this? Can we cleanse it? What what even is this? We don't even know. And I think that that quest in particular summed up to me, like just the, I think I said something to my wife, like, this is such an old, this is such an old school. Wow. Way to do this. Um, it, it, the, the waking shores in particular feels very like, yeah. an old, you know, like an old wow zone where you don't, you don't get a mini breadcrumbs. Like you just, you're going someplace and you see a quest, like the quest with the Titans area in the middle of the zone. Um, I can't find it right now. 
Uh, yeah, it's north of there. Hold on. I'm trying to find this place. Ah, uh, yes, the Life Vault Ruins. The Life Vault Ruins are Titan Ruins. And there's a bunch of quests around them, but nothing takes you there. Mm-hmm. You basically have to stumble across them while you're doing other stuff. Yeah. And I, 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 think, that's, I think that's a really interesting point, too. And that's one of the things that I, I think is great about the waking shore because it sets the tone for the rest of the expansion and the storytelling, which is your breadcrumb quests. Yes, there are going to be some of them, but that's not their main goal, right? Like their main goal is for you to explore, to fly around and find that quest marker on your map and then go, Oh, Hey, what's down there and go take a look and, and lead you other places that aren't necessarily advertised. Like your main story quest is, is pushed, right? Like that, that breadcrumbs mm-hmm. there. Um, and these places aren't like just random quest hubs on the way to the main story quest. They're off on the side. They're off on the other sides of the map. Like there's stuff involving night elves in the green dragon flight in Najuna that is, or, or the Azure span, uh, or no, I'm sorry. The, the Ashagan, Ashagari oh, plains, yeah. That is all the way removed on the left-hand side of the map. Nothing takes you there. You have to go find it. And this, we talked about it, and and somebody made a comment um, in on Discord that you know this seems to be the exploration expansion that Matt and I have been asking for, and it really is in regards to that. Like it's emergent storytelling. It's not just there leading you from point to point. You can go find things like, yeah, like today I found a random troll stable master that, you know, I was talking to because it it was lit up in uh, the halo of you can talk to this person. I went over and hit interact and was like, hey, if you can find all these things for me, uh, I'm going to go ahead and give you this this mount uh, because I rescued it when you cleared out that den of evil things. And it's like, okay, cool. I wouldn't have found that if I was just not flying around looking for random stuff today. Do you remember that troll NPC, the Choppa? Remember him? Yeah. 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 He's back in the waking shore. Yeah. He Ver- just, but he doesn't, he's like, don't call me the Choppa anymore. That is my thing. It's really just, it's like a little moment and it's funny. Ch- uh, Choppa's back. Gr- Grifta's back. Grifta's back in, yeah. in Vidalkin. Like it's, it, it, it I've, I've heard some people say that like, it's, it's sort of trying to, to play off on the nostalgia, but I don't think it is. I think it's just taking what made some of the elements of like vanilla World of Warcraft and Burning Crusade great and just applying them to a modern template. Because back then, you had to go find the story. You had to go find the quests. You had to go find what was going on in the zones. And then there was a point, I I want to say it was Wrath, really, where it just started leading you from place to place. And that sort of was the thing and there hasn't been a whole lot of divergence from it but the waking shore really sets that tone where dragonflight's like no go explore go find things go find random stuff in the world and it feels almost magical in that sense because it's not just laid out for you like i honestly i i'm kind of iffy on it like i i do think it's cool but at the same time i do like that there is a directed storytelling path to take uh, Both exist, right? It's, it's, yeah, that, that, that's the thing. They didn't just do what a lot of zones did back in original Vanilla WoW, and just like, hey, here's you know, here's thousand needles. Good luck. What am I doing in thousand needles? Eh, you'll figure something out. Or it what they did in that. Wrath and say, okay, well, here's your one quest up. Do everything here, then move on to the next one and do everything here, and that's all you're doing. Well, I mean, I would say Wrath still had some random stuff out. Sure. I would say you're really talking about Cataclysm. Oh, Cataclysm when you're talking for sure. about that. Um, and, and it does have its flaws and I, that's why I'm happy to see this going both ways. Um, one of the things I really like about the waking shore in particular though, is not just that they have all these places you can just go and explore and they have these, these little quests that are their own thing, but that not all those quests are about like the main story at Mm -hmm, all. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like there's quests here that are just, Hmm, stuff is going on. Like there's a couple of dragon can you run into or who are just like trying to map the ecology of the area and that's what they're doing. And they're not involved in like, you know, invading anything or yeah. fighting anything. And they, you know, you still fight things because there's like elemental stuff happening and it's weird. And there's quests where you get, you actually get the, the, the big quest of the big fighting quest after you do Ruby life pools where Razagath shows up and messes up the joint, you get a lot of Razagath and, and Alex draws a back and forth thing. Mm-hmm. 
And Alex Strauss is showing once again that her biggest detriment as a fighter is her constant need to try to get you to like her and agree with her. And Razagathy is not listening to a dang thing ra- that Alex Strauss says. But at the same time, not everything Razagath says is wrong. But at the same time, it's there's enough of it that you could pick apart. Like, I remember saying, okay, Razagath, so yeah, the Titans are horrible, and we should reject them for the world that gave us life, except the world that gave us life is apparently a Titan. You got anything on that one? Or, you know, you guys are talking an awful lot to the Elementals, but the Elementals were the, the servants of the Old Gods, and the Old Gods don't care at all mm-hmm. for us. Now, I know there's lore stuff out there that says maybe the Black Empire wasn't that bad. Um, I went to Nyalotha, guys. Uh the one he was going to make was pretty bad. So yeah. I have to believe the one that he was actually part of wasn't good. Um, and the very fact that the cipher of damnation is involved, uh, you know, guys, I'm sorry. Now it's right in the name. It's in the yeah. name. <laughs> but at the same time, I do like that there's back and forth here and that there's, you get to see other perspectives, the, the way the waking shore. And so far what I've seen of the Anarian planes is a really good example on how to do world building through questing and, and how to do non-military conflict mm-hmm. yes exactly because that's 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 the other major thing not to cut you off here but i want to add this in like that's it's sort of they establish this in the waking shore and you can see it carried out throughout is that you as the player you are what military force is here that's it Everything else that's been invited through are artisans, are explorers and engineers and cultural exchange specialists. And even in the opening, that's like that's the invite from Alex Strasse to begin with. It's like, do not bring your conflict here. We do not need warriors that might change in the future, depending on what happens. But well, I would say that's not necessarily that she says we don't need warriors. She's saying we don't need you to bring any of the old baggage with. you. Yeah. And, and what I really like, I don't know, like if you if you did this, uh, when you go through his horde, you probably end up, you go over and you talk to the, the orc commander from the exiles reach quest lines. Mm-hmm. And she sends you over to the Alliance one to do quests, right? Yeah. And- but the Alliance gets the exact opposite. Uh, the Alliance one from exiles reach sends you over to, to help the horde one. And in each case, they got their kid with them. And in each case, the kid is like, you know, what, what about, and she's like, no, they're honorable. We're not going to do that. We, I know that this, that so-and-so is an honorable person. We're not going to, this is not what we're here to do. Yeah. That was huge, right? That, that yeah. was a big, then, big light bulb moment. There's another quest. Did, I don't know if you did this one Um, in the, in the Ruby dragon, in, in the Ruby, uh, lay shrine. There's two old orcs. Yep. Did you do this one. Yeah. And they're like, they're just sitting there and one of them is like really old. And the other one's like, look, um, it's so good. Oh yeah. I need your help here. Uh, and keep in mind, I'm playing a human and my wife's a night elf. And so we're already kind of not necessarily the target audience, especially the night elf. Who's got a lot of resentment still built up guys, but we do the quest and we're like on the way down, they're talking and you know, he's, he's dropping hints that he's a dragon maw pretty pretty heavily. Well, He's still in the, he's still a dragon maw. He's just not a member of, you know, the, the clan as it was, he, he's one of the old school ones, but he's the one that d- he did some of the worst stuff. Yeah. And you get to one of the dragon kin and he, you're like, uh, this guy's not going to make it. And they're like, okay, we'll, we'll help you. And you go and you gather ingredients and make a magical potion and give it to the guy. But then he has like this, this bit where he's talking to his friend and he's just like, this is how it should have been for them. Mm-hmm. This is how those, those, little dragon should have lived um you know and you're like he, you can go up to him and after he's the quest is over you can go up to him and say you know hey you know you're a dragon maw right and he's like you know yes uh or you can say look i don't know what the deal is what a dragon maw even is what's going on here and he'll explain but i of course didn't say that because i i know what a dragon was but you can say to him you could either say to him you know you've done your best to try and atone in which he will tell you you know my best wasn't good enough and or if you say you know you should you should have been punished for this, he he's like absolutely, yeah. And you know, it, what what got me about that too is as he's sitting there explaining it all, and as you're interacting with him and having that conversation, a baby whelp just comes up and falls asleep in his lap. Yeah, <laughs> like and he's just sitting there holding it, like you know, almost sh- he's almost stunned. Yeah, because like that that's one of the that's one of those moments and. Uh, I may or may not have received a direct message from somebody like when I tweeted out about how that made me made me cry. Uh, But it's like it's such a beautiful moment of storytelling because like here they are. Here are these dragons 
and these whelps that don't know his baggage. They don't know what he did. They don't know what he's attempting to atone for. And even the one that does still heals him anyway, because they, yeah. they revere life. That's their whole shtick. So like he, he's sitting there, he's absolutely humbled by this, but it's, it's a moment where it's like, even the darkest pieces of Warcraft history, there can be something that comes from it that makes it right. No, no, I would argue with it. Not that makes it right. Or, or it's not right. And he, yeah, he I think yeah, yeah, he's yeah, yeah. there for that. It's not that it was that you can make it right, but you can you can move beyond Yes, it. There, yeah, that, that's a better way of saying it. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's very much the, the whole point of this is this guy does not feel at all like he can atone, that he can ever do anything to make up for what he did. But that's not the problem. The problem isn't making up for it. It's making something new. I honestly think that's the big part of Rathion's storyline that we're going to see more of after the waking shore. Whenever like the whole point is, can the black dragon flight be more than the black dragon flight has been like, it's, it's one thing to say that what you've done is monstrous. You can never be forgiven, but in the end, does it matter? This is forgiving the black dragon flight, the thing to do here, or is the thing to do here to come together and say what happened happened but right now we need to build a future. We need mm-hmm. to build a path forward for all of our whelps. We need it. So again, like that guy was telling you the story. That's why I mentioned him is because it ties in. He was telling the story of how back then all dragons were like, you know, they were all raised at the same place. The clutches all came from the, this one area. They intermingled. They played jokes on Alexstrasza together. You know, he, he fell in love with a black dragon. They, they, they were like kin. There were, there was, and that's the thing too. That's the thing that's, that's got Alex Straza tied up too, because she's trying to do that with the, with the proto drakes. She's trying to talking to Razagath saying, you know, you know, we can, we can still have peace. We can still not do this. And Razagath's not wanting to hear it. So it's like the tension between when you can't reach somebody and when you can reach them, when you can make peace and when you can't, like, how do you know the difference? How do you know when you can stop this? Like, you know, and this is a big story for Warcraft. That's Warcraft's whole thing is about breaking cycles. So, yeah, I, I thought that was really well done that they layered that all together, that there's like the multiple threads of it going through these different storylines, but it's all basically still there. Yeah. And, and that's why I wanted to talk about the waking shore in particular is because it really does set the tone for the rest of the expansion. Right. It sets the tone for what the story is going to be. Yes, there's going to be conflict. Yes, there's going to be things that we need to fight against and rally against. Uh, But it's these moments, these these tiny moments of storytelling that is sort of making you aware that you're not just here to fight. You're not just here to survive. You're not just here to, uh, you know, save the world yet again. You're reclaiming history. You're reclaiming home and a way of life for those that made a very large sacrifice to help us, right? And we're trying to give something back to them, to give them something back that they lost for 10,000 years. Uh, it's it's these little moments like that that really like sing to me as far as that goes. Yeah, I've, I've got no objection. I, I, agree, I totally agree with you on that point. Absolutely. Um, and it's, I'm not saying that this is the best WoW has ever been or anything like that. I'm not trying to make like... I don't want to be hyperbolic about it or make people like, you know, no, but it feels it good. Is. It feels good. But more importantly, it feels <sighs> Shadowlands. I, I think Shadowlands is one of the best expansions they ever did. Uh, a lot of great storytelling, a lot of interesting ideas, but it did not feel like it was a part of anything on purpose. Mm-hmm. It felt alien. It felt different and weird. I mean, it, that's what it was going for. It wanted to feel different and weird and it succeeded. But at the end of the day, this does feel like it's on Azeroth. This feels like it is wow, for lack of a better word. It is, it is very much. Uh, that's what you were talking about. People are saying this is like nostalgia bait, but I don't think nostalgia is what they're going for at all. But they want a feeling of the sense of continuation, like the fact that Rathion's got so many Pandaren in his forces. Of course he does. He's been living on Pandaria this whole time. Where else would he be recruiting? You know what I mean? Like there's. These little moments, like when you're on the boat and you go in and there's those two Draenei 
and they're like talking about, you know, oh, we've been best friends ever since. I'm hoping something will kill him so I can finally have a moment's peace. And it's just, or Azric and Jadar are there. And it's just, it's not, again, it's not necessarily trying to give you any kind of nostalgia. It's trying to make you feel like you are in the game again, you know, like in a way Shadowlands just didn't. And I think that's really fascinating. Uh, it's a really interesting narrative choice. Yeah, and I think it's one that is refreshing for us in a lot of a, a lot of ways because, like you pointed out, everything we've been dealing with for the last several expansions has been otherworldly, right? Whether it was the Legion, even Battle for Azeroth, we've been dealing with the old, we were dealing with the old gods and and the legacy therein, uh, or you know whether it was the Titans or, or or you know the Pantheon of Death and the entire realm of the Shadowlands, like there was a lot of just assault of of ethereal forces i guess would be the best way that i can really put it and this is grounded it's it like you say it feels like azeroth i think you're right right like it 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 has those echoes of vanilla but it's it feels appropriate like had they had done something like this with shadowlands it wouldn't have made sense we're supposed to be in the land of death and you know it shouldn't feel like home it, the you know if we had something like the waking shores like would that be cool Sure, maybe, depending on how they did it, but it wouldn't have felt uh, cohesive with everything else that went on. It, it, this just feels like it, it fits in and it slots in with Azeroth, and what you're dealing with is all born of Azeroth. Uh, even when you're dealing with the aftermath of the Titan stuff and going through the Titan facilities, uh, which, again, mild spoilers, but you kind of already knew you were going to be going through Titan facilities. It's on the tin, right? It, it, they, yeah. They, it's sort of like... Dragonflight now with less Titans, um, they're still there. You like, but even when you're dealing with that, like you're going through and looking at records, and it's all very down to earth. It's all very trying to explain what was going on and what happened. Uh, and it's just, it's really good storytelling using that feeling. It's giving us what we wanted without making it terrible. <laughs> um, one, one of the things that I was thinking about too is like when I mentioned before, like Sibelian shows up. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Sibelian should show up, right? But yeah, that's yeah. a thing. In the past, we've had moments like that, and they haven't happened. They haven't shown up. Yeah, like so, you would have expected, like at the downfall of an Azoth, like you know, in the Black Empire, like that would have been a key moment for Sabellian to show up at the Black Dragon Flight and rail against the old god oppression, especially if they really truly, you know, threw off the shackles of their corruption. But it didn't happen. But here you get it, and you get it in a, a more organic way. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but it's just that that thought. No, no, it's a, you were totally right. And it's, it is one of the things that I find so interesting about the way that they're kind of building this. Now, it's early days yet. It's still the first patch of the expansion. Um, the problem with, like, I've said this before about other things. You can never really tell how an expansion is going to feel until you've actually done the whole expansion. Yeah, um, hindsight like being 2020 and all that. Yeah. I feel like there's high points and low points, and you can say, at this point in the expansion, I feel a certain way. But you, you can never be like sure of what you're going to feel until you've gotten to the at least the end of the narrative of it. Um, for an example, I still think uh, Warlords of Draenor was the best leveling expansion I ever played in. Uh, getting to max level in Warlords of Draenor felt really good. Then you were at max level and there wasn't much to do for a long time. And it felt like the, the content delivery you got was really hard and arcane to figure out. And that's not saying it was bad. It's just, you know, my critique of how the story felt. Um, and got the hiccups, that's great. Good to do a podcast while trying to stifle hiccups. Anyway, uh, here right now, I am I am barely halfway through, and part of that's my own fault for only like keep constantly <laughs> playing different characters. But at the same time, I feel like I've seen enough of it that there's a lot of care put into the concept of this as this is an old place that is new. It's an old place that the Dragon Isles go back twenty thousand years. Um, but at the same time, it's a new place because it's been abandoned and and kind of in stasis for like all the time that everything major has been happening on Azeroth since the War of the Ancients. These guys missed all of it. Like they, they the place has been sitting there. It's like remember how Pandaria was sealed off and on its own for ten thousand years? It was sealed off and on its own, but they were still living lives and doing things. Mm -hmm. Pandaria was it was not. It was a a place where people had been living their lives. This isn't. This is a place that is just now coming back to life. And it's really interesting to see like the the little pieces and touches, like the the fact that Neltharion, when he imprisoned the Drakthir, he had Malagos do it. 
He didn't do it himself. He had Malagos do it. No, no. Actually, they they specify that that it was it was him. It no, was, it was him who did it, but it was Malagos's spells. Yes, and he he had the black he had the blue dragonfly, you know, basically monitoring them. So that's one of the fascinating things about that to me. Like it, it was it was all Naltharian's plan, and that's the other thing is like it, it, now as Dormo even says, it seems that Naltharian had a use for you after all. Like, what does that mean? What is what is Nosdormu getting at here? And there's a lot of stuff tied into it that I think we could probably we could probably go on more and more and more. But I don't know how much longer we we do. We have some questions to get to, so I, well, we're not going to get to the questions. We got about ten minutes. Left, maybe. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> then let's let, let's talk about that then. The the, the Drakthir's role in all this. Okay. Uh, what do you think? What do you think that means? So the interesting thing is we know why, or at least we're, we're told that the reason that they were created was to help fight against the primalists, right? We were told that that's what they were created for to be an army. Uh, but we were also told that they were created as a way of approximating mortal life, uh, to sort of understand mortals, uh, better. And the question is which of that is true or are both of them true? And, the other thing you brought this up when we talked about the short with with uh, Naltharian and and showing his quote unquote fall from grace, uh, accepting the dark bargain and opening that that portal that sort of sucked Razagath through it and you know uh, presumably put it in the vault of the primals or the vault of the incarnates. Who knows? Uh, we haven't gotten that far in the story yet. But if the Drakthir were really going to be able to fight. Razageth, why couldn't they? In that moment, he made a choice, right? He made a choice to accept the the dark bargain and send the the primalists off, and then he made the choice to not kill, but to stasis the Drakthir. I think that it may have been part of Naltharian's plan of a failsafe, because if everything was going to go the way that it was, the whispers were showing him and telling him, he needed something to maybe pres- like preserve the life of the flights moving forward. Because ostensibly, ostensibly that's what the Drakthir are doing. They're helping protect and rebuild basically from this invasion of the, the Primalists and their followers. So it's, it's interesting. And I think we're going to get a little bit more about that when we start getting deeper into like the labs and things like that. Like there are some quests that already take you into uh, what are essentially Naltharian's vaults. Mm-hmm. He, he does have vaults. He has a library. Uh, and each time you go down there, the idea is that you're going to discover more or figure out more um, potentially as, as time goes on of, of what his plans were. And especially as we move forward, it's a big area. It is a massive area. We've barely scratched the surface of it. There's a lot there that to uncover, but I would not be surprised if they were part of a, a for lack of a better term, a Xanathos gamut. Like he wasn't creating them to actually fight the primalists. Now he's creating them to fight the primalists later because he knew that they were going to be needed. Or he may have created them to fight the Primalists then, but when that didn't work out, he may have repurposed them. Possibly. Because he's really good at repurposing things. Because I, I can't I can't get it out of my head that all of the dragon flights would have talked with him. Right? Like I, I like all of all of the aspects would have at some point confided in him because he was their general. Mm-hmm. So if Norsnomu saw something, why wouldn't he say something? If you said this is a possibility or these are the visions that I'm having, because that's the thing, right? Like Norsdomu has visions and he can't always piece them together what they actually mean. That's sort of a theme. Like he's like, these are what I see. These are the bits and pieces that I see. But who's the smartest and most clever out of all of them or who was? It's not there yet. He saw things in a way that the others didn't potentially. So he could possibly be making plans off of things that others have told him that they don't understand what was to come yet. So I'm just, I, I don't know if that's actually the case. So that's out there, but w- enough of me talking. What do you think? One of the things I've been thinking about since the beginning of that, when, when Norris Dormu said that, and it ties into stuff that I, I know is coming, but I haven't seen yet. Um, for example, there's Chromie Norris Dormu interactions that are pretty fascinating that I think we'll probably talk about in the next one. Um, but, Looking at what you see in the Waking Shores about the Black Dragonflight and the Red Dragonflight, they were thick as thieves because they're living right next to each other. You're going to tell me that that Naltharian had two redoubts in this one area and he didn't interact with Alexstrasza over at the Life Pools at all? That doesn't seem likely. 
Um, and I've been thinking about the fact that if you look at the, the abilities that the Drakthir have, um, they basically have the powers of every Dragonflight except the green, right? No, they've got green too. They've what? got the green because they, they absolutely have the they have, green. They have red, blue, green, and bronze. Do they have anything from the black dragonflight? They they can call they can can call up earth and things like that. So there is there are touches. So they've got the powers of all the dragonflights. Mm-hmm. There, I feel like he would have needed the dragonflights' help to do this. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. And the dragonflights don't seem surprised. I mean, they do initially. If you're doing the Drakthir starting zone, they seem a little like what? What are you? But like, you don't. Alex Raza doesn't freak out when she sees them. You know what I mean? So I I, I I'm wondering like you know. The contingency plan, this, the Xantos Gambit idea comes to mind, but also, like, I keep coming on mind, like, what if he just straight up knew he couldn't trust the, the old gods, even as he took the deal to get the power to stop Razagath? What if he did that to pre- to preserve the Drakthir? Because at that moment, with the with the order, uh, you know, order artifact broken, he didn't have any means to unite the dragon, the Drakthir under his will. He couldn't. The, she even says, "All was confusion." The, the, the Drakthir were not a unified fighting force at that moment. It was too soon after the break. So what if that was why he did it? Because he knew we're going to need these guys later. I cannot, I'm certainly not trusting the old gods that I'm making this deal with. I know full well that these people are going to be important and therefore I should preserve them. And for that matter, we don't know how fast it took for Naltharian to go bad after he True. made the deal. Like he might not have been like a raving lunatic yet. He might have just been like, okay, maybe I can, you know, he, to to use an example from another franchise, uh, and for that matter, the legends stuff from another franchise because this isn't even canon anymore. But it, you remember the the story Dark Empire, right? Yep, sure the do. Story? Uh, when Luke decides to try and explore the dark side to see like what he can learn, like maybe he was like that. Maybe he's like, you know, I, I can handle it. I'm strong willed enough. I can be like, I know she doesn't, he isn't doing this yet, but I'm, I'm like a Lyria. I can, I can totally overcome the whispers of the void. Maybe that's what it was going on. Like he, he thought I can handle this. I can do this and I can keep my, my flight safe. But part of him was like, just in case I can't. So there's, there's a lot to keep to explore and, and think about in terms of that. But uh, the drag theory as, an, as a group are fascinating. to me. Um, but I, I'm going to tell you right now, I am so sad, so unbelievably sad that we don't have the other kinds of dragonkin as playable characters in this expansion. Um, the uh, dragonoids? Like, here, like, well, here's Sendax, who is, you know, absolutely, she's one of the, you know, that's the one we were talking about before. Look, just looking at this model, I'm like, why couldn't we get this? This is brilliant. I would totally love to have this as a playable model. Now, granted, they all look basically the same except for different colors. Whereas the the Drac the Drac here have hundreds of con- uh, thousands. I, I can't even count how many customization options. But they don't play anything but an evoker, and the evoker playstyle isn't really what I want. As as someone in our someone in our Discord today uh, linked to me a thing saying, you know, fear not the person who levels all the di- levels twelve alts of different classes. Fear the person who levels twelve alts of the same class. I'm halfway there. Yeah, we're um, yeah. yeah. I'm halfway there. I've got six <laughs> that I'm leveling right now. Um, oh, we're halfway there. Leveling without a care. Anyway, so yeah, I, I do I do think to myself, there's there is definitely more to the drag there. I like that Nosdormu seems to be hinting that when he says, you know, we'll see what role you play in these events. Yeah, and and we're gonna talk about that when we get to the the uh, bronze dragonflight part of the story because there's a lot of more interesting stuff that gets that gets talked about there as well. It's but this is the most excited I've been in a while for to see where a story goes to see what th- what we're gonna find out what threads are gonna get woven into everything that's going on. I'm really here for it, and I think the waking shore really does a good job of setting the tone. I think it really sets the expectations of here's how we're going to deliver story. Here's how you can explore the world. Here's how the emergent gameplay is going to be and sort of set it. Now we Matt pointed out that we don't know how future content is going to look uh, and we can only judge how we feel in the moment now until the expansion is completely done uh, mm-hmm. as we can only life. Can, what is it? Life can only be lived going forward, but only understood um, looking backwards. It's, I mean, the Greeks used to say, you know, you know, call no man happy until he is dead. 
I mean, because, you know, sure, you're happy now, but, you know, who knows? Maybe you'll have a calamity and all your children will be killed. You don't know until you're, until you're the end of your life. We can't tell how your life went. It's kind of like that. Um, you, you, you look back because that's the only way you can actually make sense of what happened, but you won't know what's going to happen until it happens. So, mm-hmm. but, but I, I have, I'm, I'm pretty positively, positively directed, I would say. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that as well. Like, I think, I think I'm seeing enough here. That's, that's giving me hope, I guess it's making me happy so far. And I would love to see, I'm excited to see what the next bits are going to be. Uh, but I think that's going to do it for today. I'm sorry we didn't get to any questions, but I mean, y'all, y'all listen to this podcast. You know, we're going to go off on wild, wild tangents. Yeah, we'll, it's what we do. Got future stuff. Maybe we'll do them on the, <laughs> you know, some other time. Uh, but I do want to thank everybody because without your support, shows like this wouldn't be possible. Because Blizzard Watch is literally made possible due to your generous contributions at Patreon.com/slash Blizzard Watch and your continued support, which means that this podcast sighting community is able to thrive and grow. Blizzard Watch supporters enjoy exclusive benefits like early access to the podcast, better chance at having your question answered on our podcast or the queue, and an ads-free site experience. Again, if you have questions for this podcast or any of our podcasts, be sure to send them into podcast at blizzardwatch.com. Specify the show that it is for, uh, and we'll go ahead and, and get that in as long as, the, again, it fits what we're talking about that time. Uh, but don't hesitate. Just send them in. Give it to us. We Stockpiling is good. We're like dragons, and questions are, are the thing that we put in our horde. So give it to us, please. Um, oh, also, yeah. I want to mention something real fast. Go for it. This Tuesday, uh, we'll be recording, I believe it's the 400th episode. It is the 400th episode. This this episode will be live at the time of us recording the 400th episode of the Blizzard Watch podcast. So if you've got a chance to hear it, uh, you should go. You should be show up. We're going to have a bunch, as many people as we can get on from the site, and we're going to hopefully Joe and I will get to say almost nothing and let them talk for a while. <laughs> Liz will be forced to wrangle everything. So, you know, a perfect episode as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> uh, but I did want to mention that that's, you know, guys, we've been doing this for a long time now. A long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but I do want to thank you very much because we wouldn't have been able to get to those milestones or any of the milestones that we've hit without you, our listeners, uh, our Patreon supporters, our friends. And uh, in some cases, some of you have even become guildies of mine. Uh, so thank you very much. We'll see you next week. <laughs>